Good morning, Journey Church online campus, friends, family, and especially guests. I'm Chris Long, and I want to personally thank you for joining us here today on what so happens to be National Sunglasses Day. I don't know about you, but I always get a kick out of little kids when you give them some sunglasses and they put them on and they think they become invisible to the world. In my mind, in their mind, that's reality. In my mind, I think that sometimes we as adults do the same thing and seem to feel that sunglasses give us some sort of incognito, where if we don't make direct eye contact with people, they won't notice our trespasses or offenses against them. And I think it's pretty fitting, considering that we're in the middle of a series about why we continue to do what's wrong, even though we know that it's wrong. Now today's message is about lust, and it has some very PG-13 material in it that might not be fit for little ears. So if you have children around that aren't ready to hear such a heavy message, you might want to put them in another room before Nate starts the sermon, or save it for later and listen to it when they're in bed. That being said, um, every week Nate asks for us to share in a moment with one another. And obviously this is a very uh, uncomfortable topic for a lot of people to share about. But I think we can all agree that matters like this begin innocently enough, perhaps with a love note passed back and forth, a little do you like me, yes or no, circle one at the bottom of it, or a first kiss. Both of mine occurred right here at this spot. No, it's not a vacant lot from West Side Story. This is uh, my first school over here. And behind me is the playground where uh, I got my first kiss. So um, if you have a moment, please share with somebody else where you got your first kiss or if you don't feel comfortable talking about that, maybe you got your first love note or, or wrote your first note to someone. And while we're speaking about sharing, please, I wanna share with you about the Journey app. The Journey app is where it's at for what's going on at the Journey Church. And um, particularly this week, the Journey card is on there that we ask you to fill out. If you're interested in uh, joining us in prayer or small group worship, please fill out the card. Or if you have any other requests for the Journey Church or want information, it's all right there. And there'll be a QR code popping up any moment for you to download that app. Thanks again for joining us.
don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Sing it out. Whoa.
his kingdom come. Sing that chorus again. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on. Well, welcome everybody to the Journey Church online worship experience. We're in the third message of a series we've been doing called, Why Do I Keep Doing This? And um, it's really this premise. Here's what it is. We know what good is. I mean, it's pretty easy to tell what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. I know we want to say it's convoluted, but honestly, we know. Yet, even though we know what's good, we have a propensity sometimes to do what is wrong, even when we want to do what is good. And this is a human condition, it's not a political condition, it's just the way things are sometimes. So, <laughs> this writer, this church writer, this, this man who was inspired by God's Holy Spirit to talk about it, he, he writes about this. Now, we've been talking about it for the past few weeks, and every week I'm adding a little bit more to this conversation so that we can understand what he's saying, because we have this propensity to ask ourselves, Knowing that we're doing what is wrong, why do I keep doing this? And so this church writer, he's reflecting on this condition that he has. He says, For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, for the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one who does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. If you have just joined us today, we're talking about this issue that it's very real. It's this brokenness that lives in us. It's this, this separation between us and God, between us and other people. It's our relational gaps. And it's the act of separating and the separation itself that is this biblical word, sin. And it's, it's a brokenness that exists in us, and it has damaging effects for our lives and the lives of the people who are all around us. And we've been talking about how we get to this. Why do we do this? Why do I keep doing this? And maybe you're here today, and you know you've got this feeling. Maybe you feel this issue that's in your life and you're, you're wondering, why do I keep doing this? I have these things that I'm doing. I know they're not what I want to do. I do what I, I want to do, these right things, but I do, how did I get here? I'm, Nate, I'm in pain. And if you're watching today and, and that's where you are and you're wondering, I'm going to tell you something. This is the main thing to get from this series. Listen, God's love is bigger than our sins. The things that we have done to create these separations, God's love can cross it. Why do we do why do we do these things? Well, it starts out, I think, from pride, not not self-confidence, not admiration, not I'm proud of my kids, but me. It's all about me, and there could be no one but me. I am the one who fulfills my life. It's me, me, me. And pride gives birth to this idea that we have to fulfill ourselves. And so we'll try to fill our souls with things, good things sometimes, exercise or work or food. But that's really just what gluttony is. It's abandoning self-control and letting our appetites take charge. And it just gets worse because we can't fulfill ourselves. Our true fulfillment only comes in a relationship with God. We're, we're made we're made for a relationship. We're made to get our fulfillment from relationship and, and that from God. And then we, we abandon our self-control and, and we engage in this, this deep desire for, for intimacy. But instead of actually being intimate, we create fantasies and we objectify human beings. And that is lust. And today I want to tell you that lust grows in the dark. 
but it dies in the light. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I hope you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we talk about this very difficult subject, it, Lord, I just pray that you show us the darker parts of ourselves, that you light it up, that you expose our own darkness to us. And God, give us people around us who can help us to heal from these, these places where we, we objectify, we reduce people, human beings, to just objects in order to fill our souls. Because Lord, you are the one who fills us up and you have, you have made us for relational fulfillment. Lord, speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, let me just start out by saying this. God made us for a deep, intimate, soul-connecting relationship. He made us for this relationship with Him, but He also made us to have it with other people. And one of the most glorious gifts that God has given us is this, this marriage. And he talks about marriage in terms of a man and a woman, specifically a man and a woman. There's something about the fit. There's something about the purpose. There's something about how that has been fashioned. And so when someone talks to Jesus about what it means to be married and who should be married and when they should be married, Jesus' response is, haven't you heard? God made them man and woman. He made them to be married together. God made marriage and he instituted it for the purpose of relationship. He goes on, and this is how he caps it off. He says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. What God has made, let no one separate because God has made this thing that is good. So we have attraction and attraction is good. And we're attracted to a lot of things. It calls to us deeply. We are attracted to beauty and lots of ways. We're, we're attracted to it. It's good. We have desire, a longing for beauty, a longing for fulfillment, a longing to know and be known. But after attraction and desire, we, we can start to write stories in our head and we begin to, to make it not real. It's a fantasy. And when that happens, when it becomes objectification, when we make people the objects of our fulfillment, it becomes lust. And lust is weird because, you know, it longs for intimacy, but at the same time rejects it by making people objects of consumption. So we may see someone who's attractive. Uh, we may be moved to desire. And then we start to write stories in our head. And and we do things that will give us a, an actual chemical feel-good moment because we're afraid of actually engaging in a relationship. Or worse, we're all about us and we do whatever it takes to make us feel good at the expense of the other person, making them an object. That's really the whole purpose of pornography. It is the objectification of people. It makes human beings into objects. It's a kind of idol worship in a way. We're fulfilling ourselves on our own with our own fantasy, making people less than what they are. And it's horrible. In our country, 79% of men ages 18 to 30 view porn monthly. 64% of Christian men, men who say they're Christian, and 15% of Christian women admit, admit to viewing porn monthly. So we can say with confidence that lust is a problem that is deep in our culture. Now here's the thing that I think when we ask the question, why do we keep doing this? I think it's imperative that we understand this difficult concept that lust exposes in us. In the garden story where man and a woman are in, they're given all the good things and this adversary comes in and challenges their ideas about their relationship with God and then tempts them with a lie. He promises them, he promises satisfaction at the expense of disobedience. They, the people, the people, they fall to the temptation and something happens when they practice evil, when they disobey God, when they say no to God and yes to me. And here's what happens. Then the eyes of both were opened 
and they knew that they were naked. Now that's funny because see, they had been naked all along. They had no clothes on, but now something's changed. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This concept of shame is primarily this. There's something wrong with me and I am unfixable. Shame is saying to ourself, there's something wrong with me and it or I am unfixable. And so we have these, these patterns that we behave in when lust occurs. When we write the story in our head, when we create the fantasy, when we engage in it, when we act on it, we get a shot of dopamine actually that confirms this action, it makes us feel better physically. But after it's worn off, we have to come to terms with the fact that we've done what we know is wrong. There's a brokenness. It doesn't fill us. It really just lets us know how empty we are and we feel even more empty than we did before we engaged in this action. So what do we do? You know, when we lust, you know, the first thing we do is we try to hide it. We try to not, we try to pretend it didn't happen. We keep it a secret. We want people to know. Then the second thing we do is we try to justify it. We say, you know, everybody does it. Uh, everybody's got those dirty little secrets. Um, we try to say, well, you know, she deserved it or he deserved it. We try to justify our actions of lust. And, <laughs> and then we return to it. We return to that, that action that gives us a shot of dopamine because, because we're rejecting intimacy at its true level. We have to have something that tries to fill that deep longing in us for intimacy and a relationship. We go right back to it. I have a friend who's a counselor and he said, he describes this cycle in this, uh, this lust addiction. He said, usually we do this because something has happened to us in our past. Something has happened deep within our past that's kind of hurt us and makes us feel ashamed already. So we live in this sort of state of woundedness. And when we do, we think we can't be good enough for someone else. We can't be wise enough, pretty enough, smart enough, successful enough. And so we, we see the person we desire, which desire is not bad, but we see them and then we, we write a fantasy and a fantasy is created. And then a trigger will ignite some action that we must have satisfaction. And so we, we engage in this lust, masturbation, or whatever the practice is that will make us feel better. And when it's done, we're still empty still hopeless and we feel even more helpless against this cycle of addiction. We know it's wrong and yet we will return because it feeds our fantasy. You know what we really want? What we really want is intimacy. Our true desire is for intimacy. Purity is the path to intimacy. So how do we fight against lust? lust? If purity is what we're after, how do we break the cycle of lust that can capture us and make us feel helpless? Well, step one, listen to me. Lust grows in the dark, but it dies in the light. So don't hide it. You have to tell someone. Do not hide your secret lust. You have to tell someone. And this could be very tough because this is not something you broadcast to the world. This has to be done in, in trusted circles. So tell someone, tell a counselor, tell a Christian counselor, tell a pastor, tell a trusted Christian friend. Because this problem won't get better by not addressing it. It only gets healed as you talk about it. You have to tell someone. Don't hide it. Expose it to the light. I had a friend who prayed for God to lift the darkness in his life, and this got exposed. It, is, it has been costing him relationships, a job, and friendships, but his relationship with God has grown to depths he never experienced before. He's feeling what true intimacy is with God. It's kind of wild to watch. Don't hide it. Tell someone. This proverb, this wisdom saying says, the one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses them and renounces them will find mercy. That's what God does. He brings hope and healing 
and wholeness. And he does it through his community of people. Listen, here's the other thing. When lust comes, it is obviously tempting. It promises satisfaction at the cost of disobeying, disobeying God. And it's so rich with, it makes you feel good. It is the dopamine that gets triggered. It, it's, going, it's hard to fight. So don't fight it. Don't fight lust. Flee. In fact, Paul, this writer who wrote this, I do, not do, I do not do what I want to do, he talks about sexual immorality. He says, flee sexual immorality. Run from it. Get Nike. Just go. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. We can sin and say no to God. We can sin and say no to others. But what does it mean when we're sinning and saying no to our own body? We have been made to have this rich, wonderful experience where desire brings us unity and fulfillment. But when we practice lust, we deny our body what we're actually made for. So, <laughs> tell somebody. Don't hide it. I, I want you to, I want you to, don't worry so much about saying no to things. Because when you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say yes to Christ in community. We talked about this week, saying yes to Christ in community. And if you, if you truly want healing to enter into your life, be with a group of people who will, who will practice God's real love with you, who can tell you the truth, who can provide feedback for you, who won't reject you because you've messed up, but are willing to walk with you through hard and difficult times. Say yes to Christ, who brings hope and healing and wholeness. Say yes to community, through whom God's Holy Spirit, Christ is given to the people, can heal you. And this is what I mean. This is, from the beginning, this was the experience of the people of God. The brother of Jesus himself, he talks about the power of praying together with people. People who are physically ill, people who are spiritually ill, people who are emotionally ill. And here's what he says. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. That is, you're living a life that is on a trajectory to death, but God can bring you up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Forgiven by whom? Forgiven by God, because God's love is bigger than our sins. Knowing this is true, James says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be, read this on the screen with me, healed. So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And those of us who follow Jesus, we're not righteous because of what we've done. We're righteous because of who Jesus is. Jesus who lived and died. But in his love and power and truth and goodness, he conquered death and rose. He has the power over life and death. There is nothing you've done that he can't heal you from. Jesus is the righteous one whose righteousness is given to us so that when we pray, when we pray, when we're following Jesus, when we put our trust in Him, when we, when we are exposing ourselves, confessing our sin, and daily following Him, when we pray, that righteousness has the power to bring healing into the people around us in our lives. Can you, can you believe that? That you would be praying for the people in your lives? Now, this doesn't mean all your physical ailments are going to go away, but some people I know with physical ailments have found physical healing. It doesn't mean that all of your all of your mental issues are going to go away, but there are people I know who have, who have serious issues find peace like they've never had before. And it doesn't mean all your emotional problems are going to go away, but it does mean that God uses our weaknesses to show up in our lives and give us love and intimacy and fulfillment like we've never experienced before. And He promises that there's a day when all things are made complete in your body. We don't wish for a day when we're just spirits floating around in heaven, but God promises something far more important than that. That's why it's so important to expose 
lust, this twisting of desire that objectifies other people, we must expose lust because, listen, lust grows in the dark, but it dies in the light. And the power of God in us, it exposes this darkness. And you know why it's light? It's because it's love. God's love is bigger than our sins. When we sing this next worship song in this time that I want you to, to think and reflect and read the words on the worship song, I want to encourage you to consider this. Listen, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to take out your smart device and I want you to go to the journey card uh, link. Maybe you'll click on it on this, on this uh, platform ask this question, pray this prayer. God, I confess this to you. Show me who to confess this to in your community. Now on the journey card, you can pray. You can ask for prayer. And you don't have to confess to us, but you can tell us that you want us to pray for you to find the person to confess to. You don't have to tell us your deepest, darkest secret, but you can tell us you want to follow Jesus. And we'll give you some next steps on how to do this. You can confess to us, and we will keep your truth confidential, safe. We'll keep your truth safe. And we'll pray with you as you have to face what might be really difficult consequences in the road ahead. But God is faithful. He will walk with you through all of your trials. Pray this prayer. I confess this to you today. Show me who to confess my sin to in your community. Pray this prayer. Consider sending us this journey card with your prayer. Worship God with us. Are you hurting and broken with it? sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's the reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ
the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood oh what a savior I know that this is a, is a tough subject to talk about, but it's a real problem in our country. More than ever, um, there seems to be a blurring of what is moral and good, and what's being lost is fulfillment. What's being lost is the truth that purity paves the way to intimacy. I can thank Andy Stanley for that line, but it's true. And what we deeply desire, and God made us to have desire, what we deeply desire is this, this powerful truth that we want to know and be known. If you're struggling with that, um, here's what I want to offer you. You can certainly ask us and we'll talk to you. You can certainly talk to us. But I want to offer you uh, this link. It's Hopewell Counseling. And they talk to folks who have issues in this area. If you have an addiction, a sexual or porn addiction, I want to point you to these folks. They are, they are experienced and trained to help you. But it all begins for us. The real satisfaction, the thing that we're deeply longing for is a relationship with God. And no human being can give you that. And so I encourage you, listen. Follow Jesus. Jesus who lived and died, he rose, he lives, he reigns. He wants to be in relationship with you in such a way that you find the true fulfillment you've always been looking for. Follow Jesus. And it's as simple as praying a prayer. Something like, something like this. Maybe you'll pray this prayer with me. Father, today I commit my life to following your son Jesus. I don't know why, but I believe he lived. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. I'm banking everything on that truth. And I'm going to follow him. I'm asking Jesus to be the Lord of my life as he is alive now and let your Holy Spirit come into me and guide me because I need you. Now I pray this in Jesus' name, in his name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, would you let us know? We want to help you. We want to send you information. We want to help you get connected to some next steps. So I'm hoping that you'll do that. For the rest of us, I got to tell you, we're going to need to be there for one another. We cannot condemn our friends, our family, our church friends for issues with lust. Shame is what drives it, and our enemy knows that. So I encourage you, I encourage you to do this. Check out online uh, the Hope, Hope Will Counseling, or you can give us a call. Knowing that, that is the most important thing I can tell you this week. I hope that you will engage in healing starting now. Until then, church, you are sent. Oh, what a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is love.